I think we can get started. I want to thank everybody who's joining us tonight and the artists who are presenting. Um, Gabriel will introduce the artists. So I'll just give a little introduction about um, Five Max. But first, I want to tell you that I'm so pleased that I'm at Smack Melon. Look! <laughs> Yay! And there is this amazing show in the gallery that opened on, on um, March 7th and then closed a week later. And so only the people really that came to the opening got to see it. And so I would love, so happy to tell you that we are opening by appointment uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays from 12 to 6. You can email me to make an appointment, kgillrain at smackmelon.org. And I will be here to welcome you to see the show. And Summer McCorkle has a beautiful video in the back, which doesn't show up on Zoom. And this is Jude Talachet's work. So two big solo shows. I look forward to seeing you here in the gallery. Um, now I'd like to welcome you to Five Max. And a lot of you have been uh, here for the other Five Max events. Um, for those of you who are new, I'm just going to run through what I always run through, which is that we created this series of events with our staff and some artists who are board members, and we developed this um, program to keep conversations going in our diverse communities while we are um, not coming out and going to galleries and, and being able to go to openings and things. So it's a way to meet artists, um, you know, see art, learn about new artists' work that you don't know about, and makes connections. Um, so the five artists that are presenting tonight will present for five minutes, and then there will be five minutes for audience questions, and then we'll move on to the next artist. And after tonight's presentation, we will um, hold part two, where you can sign up to meet with one of those five artists. I forgot to say that if you go to the top of your Zoom screen, if you would like to see captions, you can click Live Otter. And then on the drop down, and that means that a new window will open up, which you can move to the side of your Zoom window, and you'll see everything um, in text. So the part two of 5Max works where anybody who's in the audience tonight can sign up to be part of the closed groups, which each of the presenting artists tonight will lead one closed group. And then five artists will meet with them in, in a session without an audience. Um, and one staff member will be on that meeting too. So those happen next Thursday. You have to apply, but really what we do is go first come first serve, except that we try to make sure that we're representing um, more than 60% women, and that we have a diverse community, a, a diverse group. So um, sign up before Sunday. It closes on Sunday at 11 p.m., but it'll be like first come, first serve kind of thing. Um, so I think that covers it for 5 Max, and I'd like to introduce Gabriel de Guzman, Smack Mellon's curator and director of exhibitions. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, thanks, Kathleen, for uh, that intro. Um, thank you for joining 5Max. Um, I'm Gabriel, and I'll sort of be your cruise director this evening. Um, so before we get started, uh, let me just tell you how the program's going to run. I'll be introducing each artist uh, one by one, and then they will each give a presentation of five minutes audience, and then we'll move on to the next artist until all five have presented. Um, during the presentations, I'll be sharing my screen uh, to show the images of the artist's work, and I'll be keeping 
track of time and I'll give the artist a one minute warning to wrap up their talk. If everyone could please keep yourself on mute during the presentations, that would be appreciated. And then during the audience Q&A after each talk, um, then I will encourage you to, to participate by asking a question or making a comment about the artist's work. Um, to do that, you should write, I have a question in the chat, and then I'll call on you to ask your question to the artist, or if you prefer not to speak, um, you can just type out your question in the chat, and then I'll read it out loud for the artist to answer, and I'll order that the questions are received. Um, while I have my screen shared, your chat window might not be visible, so to open the chat window, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and click on chat. At. Um, and you might have to zhuzh the um, screens around to fit, um, I mean, move the windows around to fit your screen, um, if, especially if you have the Otter Live notes uh, going at the same time. Um, so let's see, uh, refrain from side conversations in the chat um, during the Q&A so I can easily find all the questions. And then after five minutes, we'll move on to the next presenting artist. So it's gonna be really quick and lively. Um, so I would like to welcome tonight's artist. Um, we're really grateful to you for participating in this event. Um, we know you're all really busy and um, we appreciate your spending your time with us and sharing your work with us. Um, we're going to start with Maya Cruz Palileo, followed by Kate Giordano, uh, then Lina Puerta, and then Priyanka Dasgupta and Chad Marshall, and then last but not least, Nomi Safran Han. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Whoopsie, hold on. <laughs> um, I need to go to the first slide, sorry. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so first we have Maya Cruz Palileo. Um, Maya's paintings are influenced by the oral history of her family's arrival in the U.S. from the Philippines, as well as the history between the two countries. She infuses these narratives using both memory and imagination. Maya has had recent exhibitions at Monique Meloche Gallery in Chicago, Katzen Museum in Washington, D.C., Tamor Grana in, Grane in London, and Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. Maya has participated in residencies at the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, Skowhegan, Lower East Side Print Shop, Millay Colony, and the Joan Mitchell Center. Her awards include an Art Matters Grant, Joan Mitchell Foundation Grant, Jerome Foundation Travel and Study Grant, NIFA Painting Fellowship, and Rima Hort Mann Foundation Emerging Artist Grant. Um, Maya, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Um, I'm gonna start the timer. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to your first slide. Okay, ready, set, go. Okay, so this is a large triptych uh, oil painting. Um, it's about five feet high by 14 feet wide. Uh, the title of this painting is called Under the Shade of a Luzon Thicket, Even Generals Rest at Times, and it's from 2016. And it depicts American soldiers relaxing during the Filipino-American War. Next, please. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Right. So that painting led me to research the Filipino-American War, uh, also named the Forgotten War and learning more about the colonial history between the Philippines and the United States. And I spent a month researching at the Newberry Library uh, in Chicago, looking at United States governmental photographs, reading Filipino short stories, folklore, 
and diving deeper into the racist ideology of manifest destiny uh, and also learning about anthropological projects funded by the Field Museum. Next. I brought the research back to the studio and began to draw from the images and stories I learned about and cut out the drawings to make rubbings. Next. Here's an image of the rubbings next to the cutouts. To make the rubbings, I would arrange the cutouts like paper dolls into a composition. Then I would lay paper on top and use a graphite stick to create the rubbing. I made hundreds of these. The process allowed for a new context to emerge, removing figures from a fixed place in the ethnographic anthropological context into potentially infinite combinations of new compositions and environments. Next. So this painting is called Lover at Woodland Creek Batlands. It's also an oil on canvas and it's a bit large. Um, it was inspired by a short story by Nick Joaquin in which the sound of flying fox bats returning to their cave just before sunrise signals that it's time for two lovers' illicit rendezvous to end. Nick Joaquin coined the term tropical gothic, which describes an aesthetic built on the ruins of a tribal civilization first colonized by the Spanish and then by the United States. Next, please. And this is another large painting called Ancestral Home. And for me, painting has provided a framework to reckon with these layered histories by recalling, remembering, recreating, remixing, and reimagining. Here, multiple generations, various realms, ghosts, viewpoints, and time travel are all present in this and many of my paintings. Next. So the title for this painting came from a letter from my grandmother detailing the home that she grew up in. The title is, All the While I Thought You Had Received This. This sentence resonated with me after my experience researching in Chicago. Suddenly the context that rose up around stories I had heard growing up was like a light bulb going off. Like, why am I just learning all this now? And my grandmother's voice saying, oh, you didn't already know? This painting recalls the American education system that was established in the Philippines after the war and the disorientation and violence behind that. Next. So this is a smallish painting um, called Eyes in Their Hands. Uh, in looking in the people, uh, looking at the people in the archival photographs, I am struck by those who stand out, who stare back at the viewer with self-possession. The title refers to the saying, Filipinos have eyes in their hands and speaks to the power of agency, working with our hands and this idea of seeing through making. Next, please. One minute. Thank you. This painting was in a show called Them at Periton last summer and it's called The Duet. It's quite large and was made for the show. And um, this is an excerpt from the press release. The history of painting is rife with heterosexual depictions of intimacy, couples caught in a tender embrace or in a vulnerable companionship, yet conspicuously absent throughout are queer examples of these same behaviors. This exhibition proposes an investigation into sensitive depictions of romance and the poetry of contemporary quotidian queer life. Next. So this painting is called Wildflowers, and it's also a large painting. I was inspired by the river where my grandparents grew up. I had heard stories about the river, but never saw or visited it. And then last summer, I saw a picture of my family in the river, and it was like meeting a member of my family for the first time. So this painting is loosely based on the photograph, but it is a made-up space. It's an homage and an offering to the women in my family, and the woman on the very right is my grandmother. That's it. Thank you, Maya. Thank you so much. Um, and was there a delay when I was changing the slides? Is that? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. I don't know what. I don't. I'm not sure what's causing that. But um, okay. So um, thanks, everyone. Um, who has who has a question for Maya? Um, if you have a question, write in the chat. I have a question, and um, and then. We'll call on you and unmute you. 
or and you can ask it out loud or you can type your question in the chat and I will read it out loud. Um, don't be shy. <laughs> and if, oh, okay, good. Okay, Rachel Beach uh, has a question. Um, Rachel. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, I, I love these paintings. I think they're super striking. I was cu curious in the very first image of you, of you in your studio about the size of them because they seem in this really interesting middle size where the figures are almost human, but then they're a little bit smaller than human. And I, I guess I wondered what your thought, yeah, maybe you've already answered it. That's sort of speaking to a ghost or a, sto a story instead of um, a portrait. Or what, do you th what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, these are, uh, like this painting is, I think, six feet tall. So um, you can see the person isn't quite exactly human size, but close. Um, and then some of the smaller ones are, they kind of maybe read a little more like portraits. Um, but yeah, I think it does make a difference, uh, the size of the, um, the figures in terms of a viewer relating to another figure. Um, I would say this painting is about 34 inches high by 30, so it's uh, definitely smaller than life size. Thanks. Um, and then um, Shanika Svetvilas has a question um, that I'm going to read. Um, they're asking, have you also been reading fiction by Filipina American novelists like Jessica Hagedorn, and is that an influence? Yes, I have read Jessica Hagedorn for sure. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm definitely influenced by Filipino American um, novelists and particularly Gina Apostol is um, a huge influence as well as um, other writers, poets like Joseph Olagaspi and, um, and Nick Joaquin, as I mentioned in the presentation. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, Kate Teal wrote a question. Um, hold on. She's asking, uh, she's saying, I see so much history of painting, in quotes, here, from Darger to Nea Rauch to Matisse. I'm curious who you're looking at now. I love these paintings and the cutouts, too. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that question. Um, I definitely, you know, something I think about a lot is that I'm painting with oil on canvas. Like I, first of all, I didn't study painting. I was a sculpture, sculpture person and I kind of didn't care about painting, but like it obviously had a huge impact on me. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, at the same time when I was in Chicago, there was that big Gauguin um, show, which made me want to barf, but um, you know, still look at it. It's, this, it's the work that I looked at and you know, grew up in and, and absorbed, like the ancestral home uh, is Las Meninas. And partly the very first image that I showed you guys uh, that I made in 2016 of the picnicking, they looked like picnicking soldiers, except that they were, it was actually the same time period, um, late 1800s to early 1900, uh, 1905, that the photographic archive that I was looking at was made, which also kind of aligned with um, the, this like late French impressionist paintings. And actually Gauguin used a lot of the photographs from Polynesia, um, uh, French Polynesia that were very, in the very similar vein as the photographs that I'm working with. And this one, very um, Manet, uh, uh, Dijonet sur le Herbe, uh, painting was a definitely, a, uh, I don't know, I guess inspiration might not be the word, maybe critique. Okay, great. Um, and then I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Ward Shelley has a question. Have you been or visited your been to or visited your ancestral home? Has that impacted your work, and do you or do you prefer to only work with archives? That's a great question. Yeah, actually, that's how I got interested in um, where I'm at now. Uh, first, I was making work mostly about my family's like time here in the '70s when they first moved here, um, but then I did visit the Philippines um, specifically to visit those homes and to visit my relatives who are now no longer here of that generation. My great aunts and uncles are all gone now. 
Um, so yeah, that was a huge trip for me, um, which happened before this body of work that I just talked about. Great, okay, thank you. Um, thanks everyone. Thanks Maya, that was great. Um, so now we're going to uh, Kate Giordano. Um, let me introduce Kate and then, okay. Um, Kate Giordano is a filmmaker, sculptor, and performer, originally from Pensacola, Florida. Kate now lives and works in Brooklyn. Their work has been exhibited at uh, micro Microscope Gallery, Spectacle Theater, Anthology Film Archives, and Millennium Film Workshop. In 2018, their installation, After the Fire is Gone, was acquired by the Margulies Collection at the Warehouse in Miami. Kate was a Smack Mellon Studio Program Artist in 2016-17, as well as a resident at Onassis uh, AIR in Athens uh, in 2019. Articles about their work have been published in The Believer, Bomb uh, Magazine, Hyperallergic, San Francisco Art Quarterly, and Artnet. They received a BFA from Massachusetts College of Art. Um, Kate, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, there is your first slide. I'm gonna start the timer. Okay, me too. So, ready, set, go. Okay. Um, thanks for having me. Um, the first piece I want to show is After the Fire is Gone, which revolves around a character that is half Elvis Presley, half Dolly Parton, called Dolly Presley. Um, Dolly's a waitress and Southern transplant in New York City, married to an insurance salesman named Anton. Her ex-flame returns to win her back, and the uh, piece slash film plays out like a soap opera slash classic love triangle. But what subverts, uh, next slide please. Uh, what subverts um, this narrative is I play um, most of the characters. I play her, her husband, and her ex-boyfriend, Clayton, and um, she sings and emotes to sculptures throughout the piece. Next. Um, the piece is a single channel film as well as a large scale installation. The sculptures are used to convey a more internal space in which the main character interacts with the objects, which can be, um, as you see here, in the form of sets, um, people or animals, and they tend to um, be stand-ins for people or situations in her life. Um, next slide, please. Um, the installation shows three sets that were used in the video, a farm, a living room, and a diner, and you see two of the sets from some weird angle, <laughs> weird angle in, this, in this slide. Um, uh, the narrative of the video and the installation plays out over 14 different television sets that are placed throughout the piece, and um, Next slide. Oh, go back, sorry. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> um, the piece is shot on VHSC, which explains the lower risk quality in some of the images. I'm not just bad at exporting files, <laughs> but some of them are you know, st uh, screenshots from the actual video. So now we can go to the next uh, project, which is Rome. Um, Rome was an installation in a series of photos that I made in 2018, in which I played a patrician in what I imagined would be the Roman baths. Um, I envisioned the bass as an informal space where power was wielded, not just similar to some place like a congressional gym or um, as a back channel where power is exchanged among men mostly um, and drawing parallels between Rome and our current political situation. Um, this was a durational piece at Spring Break Art Show where people would enter and exit the space and I would be posing wearing what I call nude armor, um, which as you can see is, you know, a, a breastplate that mimics a, a piece of armor that is you know, man's chest and, um, uh, and, a, <laughs> and a phallus. Um, so uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, details from the sculptures, I pretty much use any material, um, but specifically here I use tape, wire, spray foam, cardboard, uh, acrylic matte medium, um, you know, any, any, pretty much anything I can find that's uh, around. <laughs> around. I'm, not, I'm not a material-based uh, sculptor, really, I just sort of am you know, I'm a hot, I'm into hot glue and like whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, my work always mixes three elements, which is generally um, sculpture, performance, and some sort of video. Next slide. Um, and I'm interested in what happens in the psychology of what happens when um, actors interact with sculptures and those things kind of collide. Um, so, next slide, please. 
Um, last project I want to talk about is what I'm working on now. Um, this is called Henry Rex, I think. I'm not quite sure about the title yet, but um, it's going to be shown as a solo show at Postmasters Gallery. It was supposed to open in May, but obviously plans have changed. So uh, we're hoping that the show will open in October. Um, I played King Henry VIII, who was um, you know, the infamous English Tudor monarch who had, eight, had six wives. And um, it plays off of similar themes in the Rome piece in the sense that it takes a historical figure and talks about issues of power and control. But in this case, the work revolves around Henry's relationship with two of his six wives, Anne Boleyn, who was infamously beheaded, and um, Anne of Cleves, who actually survived her marriage to Henry and lived to tell about it. Um, it involves Henry's ambassadors negotiating his marriage to Anne of Cleves. Next slide. Um, that's, that's a still from him dancing with the ghost of Anne Boleyn. Um, <laughs> so uh, with this work, I um, am pressing the idea of wearable sculptures. Next slide. Um, and I've been working with fabric uh, and sewing for the first time. Um, with other pieces, I've been very concerned with playing off of cinematic language, but this was all shot with a straight on camera angle. And I feel like the work more mimics, um, you know, dance and theater and sort of documentation of that. And it's meant to be shown as just an installation um, with the sculptures as opposed to a single channel video and an installation. So it's sort of a departure from the structure in which I worked before, but obviously, you know, it's still, I made it. <laughs> so uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Right, you finished exactly on time. Um, <laughs> so, Oops, sorry, um, okay. yeah, I do. So we do have some questions coming in. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Mary Temple. Mary asks, um, or she says, I'm excited to see the next installment of the King Henry and his wife series. In the first one, you played Henry's beheading of Annie as sort of a bumble. Will he be any self, any more self-aware in the future episodes? Um, I don't think anyone that can quite do that sort of thing is particularly self-aware. Um, so I think I, 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 you know, I, I, there's definitely like comedic elements to it, which is also, you know, it's a very tragic and violent thing. But um, I think, you know, I, I play him with a sense of seriousness and I, I play him with a sense of seriousness that he obviously takes himself and um, I sort of, I mean, I, I try to convey that, that sense of history and the sense of violence in the way that I portray the character. But um, in general, I think he, I wouldn't necessarily call him a bumble, I would call him, you know, a, a monster. Um, and I, I hope that I convey that in the way that I portray the character. Great, uh, thanks. Um, and then Rosa has a question. Um, I see your sculpture, Rome, Men TV and your videos. Uh, storytelling as both masterful in their form, and I wonder if they feel as separate disciplines and how you negotiate slash feel work between the two. Um, <laughs> I yeah, I work. Uh, I feel like when I make sculptures, I'm sort of thinking about what I, I make them at the same time, and I go back and forth between the two. I don't I don't consider them a huge separation, and and, and generally. I generally make sculptures with the idea that they will be used in some sort of video or, I mean, I make them as standalone things, but I also incorporate them with like a larger scope of what I do. But some of them I don't, like the TVs that I made, I think you're looking at my website perhaps, but those those were just sculptures. But um, I, I think when I'm doing sculpture, I'm, it's sort of like writing for me. Like I, I make sculptures, I film with them. Sometimes, you know, that doesn't work out or it does. And I, I feel like the back and forth is very much part of my process, but they're they're very equal in the way that it work. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then Rotem Liniel has a question. Um, Rotem? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, hi, I just wanted to ask you about your relationship to camp, particularly and how it's um, kind of transmorgified and turned into something that has kind of been uh, subsumed into certain mainstream aesthetics. Uh -huh. um, and You're breaking up on the last part of the question. Sorry. Oh, shoot. Um, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. I'm just I'm wondering about your relationship to camp, particularly as kind of a queer aesthetic and how it's been subsumed into kind of a more mainstream 
um, pop cultural aesthetic and just like what your relationship to that is? Um, I, I think you know in, in, in when I'm looking at the work uh, afterward I, I totally understand and, and um, would even self describe some of the work not all of it is camp but um, when I'm making it I, I feel like I'm just I'm just sort of serious about it I know it's kind of hard to believe because there's a lot of comedic elements in it but I think you know they I think I'm playing off of things that I've seen and I'm playing off of things that I've seen on television and I've seen in media my entire life and I feel like I'm in a way like inserting myself into those things um, kind of by any means necessary you know it's like oh well I can just like throw on this wig and like put up some cardboard and then like I'm I'm this like soap opera star or like you know like I can be an ancient room like I just have to put on like this weird thing that I just made you know so I feel like there's like me kind of inserting myself in that and um yeah, and I, I think with all these things coming together, and especially with reference uh, to, you know, drag elements, I mean, it definitely is sort of like a queer um, retelling of a lot of this stuff, but also like it's, in a lot of ways, it's just like what I'm, <laughs> I feel like a lot of these things I put on it afterward, but in the, in the moment, I just sort of feel like that's what I'm compelled to make. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's really, yeah, sorry. Uh, I have more to say, but I'll, I'll contact you personally. Yeah, email me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thanks for Tim. And uh, I think we have just time for one more um, from Rachel Beach. She asks, is there a script or words? Um, and if so, is it pre-scripted or just, or is it just physical presence? Um, I um, guess. It's not, nothing is scripted really. I mean, sometimes I have to redo things enough times that there what there is a script based on the fact that I've had to do it six times. Um, but uh, no, not really. There's not really a script. And if there is a script, it's not generally adhered to in any way. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank, you, thank you all. And I just want to also say I made I made um, a lot of I made some of this stuff at Smack Mill, and I really appreciate the support they've given me over the years. So just wanted to thank you guys. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, there are more questions in the chat. So uh, I just wanted to mention that at the end of the talks, we're going to share everyone's um, uh, website addresses um, so you can find their contact information. And if you want to follow up with questions, you can do that. Um, great. So now we have Lena Puerta. Uh, Lena, are you there? I am. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah. OK, great. Uh, OK. Lena Puerta was born in New Jersey, raised in Colombia, and now lives and works in New York City. She has exhibited nationally and internationally, including a solo exhibition at Smack Mellon in 2018. Lena is currently the 2019-2020 artist in residence at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling in Harlem. Other residencies include the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans, Dieudonne, workshop residency, um, our workspace residency, color art, arts industry residency, and the 2013-14 Smack Mellon Artist Studio Program. She's been honored with the 2017 NIFA Fellowship in uh, Crafts and Sculpture, Art Prize 8 Sustainability Award, and Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Grant. Lena earned an MS in Art Education from Queens College and a BA from Wells College. Um, Okay, are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to start on your first slide. Okay, ready, set, go. Thank you. Um, hi everybody, I am um, a uh, mixed media artist working in a wide range of materials and processes. But I, for this presentation, I've chosen to um, focus on handmade paper, which I started making in 2016 through the residency with Dudonet, which is a paper making studio based in Brooklyn. These works, <clears throat> which I exhibited at um, Smog Mellon, these two first slides, um, are based on Renaissance tapestries and thinking of them as um, a, a, status symbols that are um, deemed highly valuable in our uh, society and Western culture and uh, presenting, depicting them in, uh, in a state of uh, decay and deterioration. And you're going to move the slides, right? Yes, I was trying, but it's not. Okay. okay. 
Oh, are you moving it for me? No, I'm not touching it. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Um, so, um, do you want me to go back? Can you just uh, move them for me, please? Because it's. Yeah, no problem. So, yeah. this one, right? Yeah, so this is from the tapestries um, that I did in 2016 uh, at Dudonet uh, during the residency. Uh, we can go next. And then 2017, after the presidential election, I wanted to uh, do work that, um, that somehow related to the, my Latino culture because of um, all, the, um, all what was happening. And I was lucky to have the opportunity to create a, a, this new series or, or another series of tapestries, but um, honoring far, Latino farm workers in the US. I, um, we can go to the next. Um, these works, uh, I picked different crops from the US and not only did I incorporate the, the body of the farm worker, which is actually for sign, I, um, use uh, figures uh, in my work, uh, but not only the body of the farm worker, but also the, the different plant, um, parts of the plant, like not only the fruits or the vegetable, but the, the leaves, the flower, the pollinators, and thinking also of the farm worker as part of this beautiful cycle. Next. Uh, I have also incorporated um, different quotes from different news sites um, that um, speak of the different issues, social issues that um, these communities that are marginalized communities uh, face in, under our racist system. Next. These works are also with a lot of uh, decay in them uh, that also um, reference, uh, the, the past tapestries also reference colonialism. Um, from there in 2018, I decided to expand this uh, series by creating um, smaller portraits of farm workers. And I sourced these images from the internet. Um, I used uh, a, a type of, um, uh, technique. Um, all, all of this is done in a web studio, uh, but using uh, uh, stencils and uh, something called a blowout technique where I mask, in this case, I mask all the foliage and uh, with a water hose, I remove the paper pulp that is still sitting on top wet. So as I remove that, the uh, layers underneath that have the sequins, fabrics, and all the different other textures are revealed. Next. And this, these works, these portraits are also have some hand painting uh, with, um, with paper pulp. Let me go to the next slide. Okay. Um, Less than a minute. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and then it's not going, we can go to the next. Uh, okay. Um, then uh, this, I did a series of um, vegetables uh, based on a story uh, from Willard, Ohio, which is an uh, agricultural hub. And, and um, in this, in this uh, town, they, um, they normally have, they hold a festival for decades. They have held festivals for the migrant workers that come to tend to the crops and this year they canceled it. So I imagine these vegetables, this is called radish and headdress. So I imagine these vegetables uh, holding a festival as also oppressed organisms, living organisms. So I imagine them as holding um, a festival for the migrant workers. And then the last two we can show um, are uh, created during uh, COVID. Well, I created Duvernay and then I finished them this year during the lockdown. Um, that also relate to um, our connection, um, our deep connection between nature and um, and the and and the food, the thinking of food as as nature as the garden, and our deep connection, and thinking of also how indigenous culture uh, relate to 
um, nature in a very different way than ours. That is more deep and um, and um, magical and spiritual as well. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lena. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, with the slides, but anyway. Um, I hope I didn't see Gabriel. It's it's in it's it's going by itself or what? No, I. Okay, I think I think it's I think it's back to normal. Okay, so um, thank you, Lena, <laughs> and um, that who has questions for Lena? Um, okay, um, Cindy uh, Cindy Pound has a question. She says your work is beautiful. Um, I see you teach storytelling to children. Can you expand upon how you think about the role of narrative storytelling in your tapestry? I think that's more referring to your residency at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum of Art and Storytelling involved in your residency there, but, um, but can you ask, about, I mean, can you talk about the role of narrative and storytelling in your tapestry work? Um, I don't, um, I don't know. I don't really think of narrative in it, I guess, uh, <laughs> or storytelling. Um, I think now that I am, um, researching a bit more, uh, about indigenous culture, I think I am thinking of like oral histories and how storytelling is such a um, plays an important role, but it's not something that I think of um, when making this work. Um, and at the residency, I am involved in um, doing like workshops and I interact with the children, but I don't particularly do stories with them. Um, so I don't know if I am um, answering the question. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, okay, um, and uh, Re Renee Ray has a question. Can you speak to the about the beautiful materials you choose to combine and what meaning they have for you? Thank you. That's a great question that I, I wish I had addressed, them, but I didn't have time, so I'm glad you asked. Um, I um, collect different materials that uh, relate to the body, like body adornment, um, and uh, that I use to roll throughout my work, not, not just the paper pieces. And uh, with the farm worker pieces specifically, um, I started to incorporate uh, textiles from uh, Meso Mesoamerica and uh, in, and especially the in indigenous cultures of uh, Mesoamerica and because I wanted to incorporate some, something of that uh, spoke of the richness of, of their ancestral, of the farmer's ancestral culture. Um, I think I also pick materials that I am attracted to, that I fall in love with, that I can't uh, get rid of, that many of these thesis uh, I've been uh, carrying for years, decades. I can't get rid of them because uh, I have, um, I just like them a lot. Um, so I also like materials that are celebratory in some way and that hold joy, that hold love. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Rachel Kahn asks, how do you think about the outside edges and the framing within your work? So I think it's some of the, the way that the work kind of spills out of the edges. Yeah, um, I work, I mean, these, these uh, tapestries, uh, especially the large ones are very, are quite planned because I have very limited time to make them in the studio. 
uh, because I need a, a whole I needed a whole team to create this, and I worked with the paper makers there. But a lot of my process, even though I have a lot of it planned, much of it is intuitive when I'm in the middle of the work. So all of these edges kind of happen, and I like the idea of not sticking like going beyond the rectangular or 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 sharp edge. Um, so that's sort of how that happens, but it's not particularly planned. Great. Thank you so much, Lena. Um, I think that's all the time we have, but um, I really appreciate it. Thanks, and, um, I also, for, yeah, thank you. I also forgot to mention that um, both Kate and Lena had video links that they wanted me to share <laughs> in the chat. So I'm going to copy, um, I'm going to copy Lena's video links in the chat. The link I, sh uh, the one of the links ha is a video about the farm worker pieces and they show um, much of the process that it's hard to explain uh, how the paper making and embedding and all the what all of the different process of the paper making is difficult to um, explain without seeing it. So that might help. Um, okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. And then um, I'm going to share Kate Giordano's um, video links as well. Um, and there are clips from after the fire is gone and uh, Henry Rex, Henry dances with Anne Boleyn. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now um, we're going to move on to Priyanka Dasgupta and Chad Marshall. Um, are you guys there? Yep. Okay, great. Um, okay. I'm going to introduce you real quick and then um, you can start your presentation. Priyanka Dasgupta and Chad Marshall began collaborating in 2015. Their work is located in the gaps between history and storytelling, drawing from archival texts, sociological conventions, oral histories, postmodern theory, and postcolonial studies. The work exa examines power and privilege in the US and their relationship to image and appearance. Exhibitions of Priyanka and Chad's collaborative work have been presented at the Knockdown Center in Queens, Dodd Galleries, University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, Wave Hill in the Bronx, Cuchifritos Gallery in New York, Abrams Art Center New York, Sculpture Center New York, and Asian Arts Initiative Philadelphia. Residencies include the 2018-19 Artist Studio Program at Smack Mellon um, and Airspace at Abrams Art Center. They're also recipients of the prestigious Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship for 2019-2020. Um, great, so are you guys ready? Um, yeah, we're ready. I think your um, full screen has gone out though for the screen sharing. Oh yeah, sorry, that was my fault. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, um, all right, I'm gonna start the timer. Set, go. Right, um, thank you for having okay. us. <laughs> what, no, shouldn't go. <laughs> um, so the first image is an image of Bahauddin Alam, uh, who essentially became Bobby when he came to America. Um, so Bobby is a composite character that we created in order to draw attention to the forgotten histories of Bengali sailors who worked on British merchant ships and passed as black um, in order to circumvent the laws against Asian immigration uh, extending from the Chinese uh, Exclusion Act of 1885 and migrate to the, the US. So Bobby is directly inspired by Bardu Ali, who's the son of Moksad Ali, who was one of these act these passing Bengalis. And um, Bardu was the front man of the Chick Web Band and is credited for having discovered Ella Fitzgerald. And so like Ali, our character Bobby is also a jazz musician. And his, his uh, career spans um, the 1920s to the 1950s. So now, Second slide, which is which is which is where we're at. So I'll just keep talking. Um, 
So our portrait for Bobby, which was the first slide, is appropriated from an image of a Bengali peddler from the phrenological text, The People of India, which was compiled by the British between 1868 and 1875 and used as a political tool in subjugating India. And the manuscript was later revealed to be propaganda with many of these images within stage. So the reason that we appropriate them is also to draw attention to that fact. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this, other, this image is another image from the same manuscript, which we have also embellished to create images for Bobby. Next slide, please. So this is the embell embellished image from that previous image that you can see here. So the process of painting and collaging over archi archival material has become an exa exemplar of this body of work. At this time, we've created multiple images of Bobby's bandmates, partners, friends from this particular, using this particular manuscript as a source. And the technique of collaging and painting also references similar embellishments undertaken by the British with their own images in order to appear more appealing to India, to Indians. So this kind of parallel or the tension between official modes of camouflage and indiv individual instances of passing for survival are also very important for us to examine and think about in our work. Um, next slide, please. The appropriation and repurposing also alludes to an important aspect of our work, the, re <coughs> the use of reclaimed art um, materials in the construction of our site response installations, specifically the shipping pallet, which we use to create Bobby's living space, his rehearsal space, and uh, performance spaces that we see here. This is an installation shot from our show. Uh, Kitchen Hall, which was at the Knockdown Center in Queens last summer. Pallets in the background, you can see that structure. It makes the entrance to Bobby's tube joint at the performance stage. And the pallets in the foreground are used to create the uh, rehearsal space where Bobby and his friend practiced. Next. This is another image from the same installation. The lighting fixture on the wall is okay. designed as a marquee sign. And it is shaped in the uh, shipping routes that Bobby used in, on the ships he worked on to get from Calcutta to New York. Next. Next. This is an image from the side of the stage entrance and it opened me here back. And it's covered with uh, wheat paste band posters that we created from Bobby's various concerts, which again uses images from the people of India combined with photos from other musicians that would have been uh, Bobby's contemporaries. Next. So this is uh, from our first uh, iteration of Bobby Hole, which is at uh, UGA. <laughs> oh, oh. At UGA in Athens. And again, the uh, shipping pallets are used as uh, an allusion to uh, Bobby's history uh, as a Lascar on British merchant navy ships. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an image uh, from a rated video from uh, our installations. It's called Welcome Stranger. And our video work uh, uses uh, found images, again, with the reclamation idea from uh, soundies, which were jazz era music videos, and our own staged home movies of Bobby. Next, please. And this final image is of Bobby's zoot suit and which was, again, we're combining aspects of his culture, kata stitching in the uh, pinstripes and with the shipping routes, which are in orange. And then there's a highlighted gold path, again, tracing like the light fixture from Calcutta to New York. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yay, thanks Priyanka and Chad. Um, <laughs> Who, who has questions for uh, Priyanka and Chad? Uh, okay, Rachel Beach has a question. Uh, yeah, I was, it sort of uh, got me thinking about um, the level of finish that you choose for each of your objects and the way that those levels of finish might imply a certain level of authority to, an, to, a, um, you know, to a given object. 
uh, and then this new incorporation of the palette sort of takes it in a, a different direction, sort of like an artifact instead of like a, a highly produced object. A lot of your previous work has a more like clean production, which has that language of authority. So I'm wondering what you guys think about that. Um, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. Um, mainly, I mean, I haven't really thought about it um, because a lot of, I mean, everything is handmade and a lot of it is experimenting with new materials. So thank you that you think <laughs> But like working on the suit, like I worked, on, I, I sold for the first time. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, but I, I, think, I think there is like an interesting kind of um, tension between, not that I'm just thinking about it now, the tension between um, the attraction of these finished objects, which also kind of lend to the exotification of the, Im the immigrant body and the, the ways in which the, we come here, which is signified by the palette. Does that make sense? I don't know. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Um, and now we we have a question from Ward Shelley. Um, he says, uh, collaboration is always an adventure. How do you work it out in your collaborations? I do what she tells me. <laughs> no, I do what he tells me. <laughs> you, just, you just saw, you saw a live um, presentation of of, of us goofing off, so <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> Do you feel like you have, I mean, I'm, I'm asking a follow-up question now. Do you feel like you have specific roles that you designate each other when, you, when you're working on a project or you, does it happen just organically or do you kind of work to your specific skill sets or how does it, how does the kind of collaborative process work? Um, I think, I mean, the main crux of the process is that we argue a lot and we, we're not afraid of arguing um, with each other. So we don't compromise or we don't give into an idea unless we're actually convinced about it. Um, but then in terms of roles, a lot of times, um, a lot of the formal research, I get drawn to a lot more. Um, and then Chad is very interested in the material research aspect uh, of it. So that that's a kind of division of labor in a sense, but that also has like bleeds over um, where we kind of switch roles. She does the thinking. No. Okay, thank you. Um, And then we'll take one more question, which is, um, can you sit here in this? Did you hear that? No. You didn't hear the question at all now. Oh, sorry. Can you speak about the freedom of invention with the fiction of Bobby versus an adherence to historical truths? Um, um, so there's a couple of layers to that. Um, one of them is like the politics of the fact that histories that have um, repeatedly been been um, marginalized um, have not been written and have not been recorded, and as a result, don't exist in official archives. And 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 as a result, in order to be able to tell them, we have to invent them to some extent. Um, and the other reason is that there is um, research now that's being that's coming out about these Bengali sailors. Um, it's fragmented and it has a lot of holes. Um, and we didn't feel comfortable imposing information onto a body that has lived a very complex life, but we wanted to draw attention to that life. And so it made more sense to create a fictional character and use the politics of that creation to draw attention to this history. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for your presentation and um, answering the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
now we're going to go to Nomi Safran Han. Um, Nomi, are you there? Yes. Okay. Nomi Safran Han works, uh, her work follows a close examination of the history of painting and its tradition of charged architectural spaces. She has had solo exhibitions at Slag Gallery New York, Brandt Gallery Amsterdam, and Marfa Contemporary in Texas, as well as group shows at the Haifa Museum of Art, Brooklyn Museum, Marianne Boski, and PPOW. Nomi has participated in residencies at Skowhegan, Art and the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. In addition, she's been a Vizcamore, Yale, and Vassar. Nomi received an MFA from Yale University School of Art and a BA from Brandeis University. Um, thank you. Um, are you ready, Nomi? Yes. No, are you? Um, okay, great. So go ahead and start. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for this wonderful introduction and for Smack Mellon uh, for inviting me tonight. And it's uh, just been incredible to follow this amazing group of artists presentation. So I'm honored. Uh, this is a view of my most recent solo exhibition at Slag Gallery titled All My Lover. It was slotted to open April 3rd. Of course, it didn't happen then. We installed it later and had a 3D um, a visual tool, um, which I hope the link would be in the chat later, maybe added or it's on my website. Uh, next, please. The first um, uh, painting I want to show you is the one uh, right here on the, on the left hand side. It's called Taking Me For Granted. In my work, I am interested in using materials that are uh, uh, um, not typical for painting. I make cement with lace and uh, use acrylic paint and photography. I'm interested in pushing the boundaries of painting and photography, asking questions about truth and fiction. Uh, we believe in the photograph and think painting is a fiction. In my work, I try to flip the script and question really what you think about reality and how you experience it. Um, next, please. Um, in the next image, you can really see the panel on the right um, hand side is a photographic image that I, I took the photograph from my hometown in Haifa and I mounted the photograph. I printed out the photograph large scale and I mounted it on canvas and it's uh, mostly uh, taking up all of the right hand side panel. Maybe Gabrielle can go over. There's a nice line where the photograph meets the painting, the painted canvas. Um, the panel on the left hand side is all only made of cement and lace and fabric cement lace fabric and acrylic paint. And it's try, it, it tries to echo the photographic image, uh, creating an after image, a memory of the space, really uh, emphasizing the composition and light. The next uh, slide, please, uh, if you could go next, is a detailed shot of the panel on the right. And you could really see uh, kind of the extrusion of the cement through the lace. So when I glue the photograph to the canvas, I cut holes in the photographic image and the canvas, and I stretch different colored lace depending on where in the photograph, what happens in the image, the photographic image. So you can see that the, the exactly where the cursor is right now, those uh, orange, orange, yellow uh, lace matches the kind of uh, dilapidated color of the mattress. Uh, the white things that are pushing out is cement. When the painting is flat, um, uh, I face the, when the, sorry, when the painting is full of the, the lace, I put the painting flat facing the floor in my studio and push the cement through, creating a texture surface. In the next, and you could also see the brush strokes here where I use cement as paint and I go over um, part of the painting. In this detail, it's the same painting, it's the panel on the um, left hand side and you could see the texture of both uh, the different lace pieces that I use and the, the, using the paint on inside the cement. Uh, I was really influenced by fresco that I learned in Skowhegan, uh, and I use that in the painting process in my studio where I, I push the cement. I, sorry, I, similar to fresco, the paint is inside the cement. Uh, next, please. 
Um, this is another uh, installation shot from the show, and you can see the painting we just uh, talked about. It's called Mirror Stealing a Room with a Mattress and a Chair, and it's quite large. It's at 48 by 120 inches. Next, now we're going to look at the two small pieces on the side there. I'm also interested in abstraction and kind of the relationship between figuration and abstraction. In some of my work, I only use cement and lace uh, to create pattern and shapes. This is an example. It's called the fire next door. It's 18 by 12. And you can see the different texture of cement that I use, both pushing through the lace and flat as part of the cement. Next, I'm running out of time. Um, this is a piece made out of weaving barbed wire. Um, if we can, we have, we have a little bit of a delay. It's called the pattern of my surrender. And I'm interested in doing the impossible with my materials. I'm always attracted to really difficult ideas. So I weave the barbed wire and I embedded it in the cement and lace. Uh, the color red here is from the lace. And I thought about the way the body, of course, interacts with barbed wire. Next, please. Um, another installation shot. And the last slide, I think, is a piece called uh, Those Who Got Away. It's um, a piece that I made out of the pattern of the lace that I thought reminiscent figures. Um, I made it in March. I thought about those who got away from COVID or those who got away from New York. <laughs> and I think I'm at time, no? Yeah, but thank you. Um, that was great. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank Nomi. You. Yay. Um, and uh, let's see, Audrey um, posted a link to the to the 3D um, exhibition uh, footage of your show at Slide Gallery, which um, people can experience virtually on the um, on the site. Um, uh, let's see. Kate Teal made a comment that your work makes me think a little bit of Ilana Herzog's work, and yes. yeah, you're happy about that. Yeah, Elana is actually um, our new board member of Smack Melon, so um, we really love Elana as well. Um, and then there is a question from Ward Shelley. Um, I think the scope of your narrative is pretty universal, but when your images are presented in conjunction with your bio and location of your source photos, I imagine the work takes on political readings. I wonder how you feel about that. Do you prefer the images to be presented with or without Israel as the background of the work? Did you hear that? Yes, yes. Ah. I'm not shy of being Israeli. I am not shy of being political. I think the problem sometimes in the art world is that people like to pigeonhole you. So I would say my answer is depend on the viewer depend on the studio visit. I think of paintings as vessel of meaning. And so the viewer can embed their own meaning in the painting. The power of making painting is that I control the vessel. So think about the home. My home has always been politicized, but now everybody's home is part of politics because we are all at home. <laughs> We're all connecting virtually. And so the home is such a malleable thing and we all have a relationship. The fact that Israel and Palestine is such a contested place um, and we call it politics is because of the historical context, but it, it happens everywhere. It's everywhere. And so I really think it, the conversation can go wherever the viewer is ready to take it. And I'm happy to facilitate in, if I'm there present. And if I'm not, I hope the painting can lead the viewer into these questionings of taking the taking our home for granted and that comfort. Um, there's a follow up question that Ward has. Um, he's wondering, what if you were prevented from going back to Israel uh, because of the virus? Would you would you want to apply your eye and the theme of your work to other locations? Well, I didn't go home because of the virus. I wanted to spend July with my mother to celebrate her birthday. But I have to say that I carry my home inside me already. And, my, and I think if we looked at everybody's presentation today, the, under, the underlying kind of 
Karen, is that we all have a relationship to a very specific history that we carry from a relationship to the, our family histories. Like there's all, I think artists create from a personal place. So it's not so much about the geography of needing to go back to that place. That place exists in me and I am obs clearly obsessed by it, right? Or my whole practice is about that. But may I suggest maybe it's about me, <laughs> which is kind of a selfish idea, but you know, we all make work at the end of the day with our, with our own interest inside of it. So, I, and also at this point, practically I've had, like, because I've been going back, I've been going back to this one neighborhood to take photographs in my hometown for the last uh, 12 years. So I have a huge personal archive that I can always go back and I can make paintings forever. So I don't need any more the physical space. Forever and ever. Um, <laughs> and then um, I'm just gonna ask one more question. Um, this is from Rachel Beach. Um, she says, I see physical slash psychological, um, if it's something that you think about um, and sort of weight in terms of material as well. Right. I think that it, what's interesting about the weight question is also about illusion, because the illusion of the paintings is that they're heavy. But in factuality, they're just as heavy as a, can as a painted canvas because my cement is very thin and I use it more like uh, paint rather than as a body. Um, but I do think that the, the work is heavy, it ha it, and, and I like that. I think it's, it's, it's very uh, serious, and, and, you know, and, and, and that weight helps the painting, right? Um, it's not, uh, I, I don't want to use the word pessimism or optimism, but I think the work um, thinks about uh, the heaviness of, of space, of history, of materials. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nomi. I think we're out of time, but um, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'm going to um, paste. You had other video links, I think, that you wanted us to include. So I'm going to paste those into the chat real quick. And, um, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Okay. So those are the um, the links that you wanted me to you wanted us to share. Um, so I want to thank you all so much. The the six artists who presented: Maya, Kate, Lena, Priyanka, Chad, and Nomi. Um, we really appreciate your sharing your work with us. Um, and I also want to thank the audience for your great questions and comments, and for um, sticking it, it out with us. I know that we've had a little bit of technical <laughs> glitches this time around, so thanks for your patience. Um, if anyone in the audience is interested in asking artists um, follow-up questions about their work, uh, Becky is going to post their websites in the chat. Um, and you can go on their websites to find their contact information. We're also including their Instagram handle so you can follow them on social media. Um, and then before you go, let me just remind you about part two. So those, okay, so Becky just posted the websites and Instagram handles on the chat. Um, but let me just remind you about part two. Um, we're gonna share the link to the submittable application again. Um, and if you're an artist and would like a chance to participate in part two, which are the closed group meetings with one of these five artists who just presented, or six technically, um, you could submit your work on Submittable using the link. You have until this Sunday, July 26, to submit. The deadline is 11.59 p.m., but um, the spots are limited, so submit early. Um, try not to wait until the last minute. Um, and if you're selected, we'll get back to you with the details. And also, um, if you have participated in previous um, part two group sessions, um, you can, you're allowed to submit again if you want to participate um, in one of the groups this time around. Uh, but we will prioritize people who haven't 
um, participated in the past. But uh, just so you know that, but feel free to submit your work again if you want to if you want to participate again. Um, and then we'll get back to you with more details if you're selected, but basically you'll be doing what we just did today, presenting your work to the group, following a similar format, five artists share their work, five minutes max, um, five minutes of discussion uh, after each uh, presenter. So the closed group meetings will meet next Thursday, July 30th at 6 p.m. Um, the information is also on our website, smackmelon.org, on the, the 5 Max program page. Um, okay, thank you again, everyone. I want to thank my colleagues, Kathleen Gilrain, our communications and events manager, Audrey Irving, and our programs manager, Becky Selinger. Um, I appreciate all of your support on these programs. Um, thanks for your work. And thank you again, everyone. Thanks, artists. Um, have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for the presentations. Thanks. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, Doug Mellon. Hey. Bye. Bye. Thanks, you guys. Hey, okay, bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Gabriel, Kathleen, and Audrey. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. bye. bye.